Hi, I'm Jim Gabe, founder of Citizen Arts. Welcome to our new episode of In Their Words, What Public Officials Do For Us. This series takes a close look at some of the vast range of people who serve us at the federal, state, and local levels. Why a close look? Because we entrust them with responsibilities and powers that affect our lives in big and small ways every day. If you haven't listened to our prior episodes, please do. You'll hear that state secretaries of state do far more than certify elections. For example, fighting cyber election misinformation. You'll have an interlude with a non-judgmental judge who cuts through the critical public discourse about justices with insights into the noble role of those called to the bench. We introduce you to a state rep, a self-described lifetime fighter for equal rights who gets 90% of her community's vote. You'll meet an attorney general, a prosecutor born to solve homicides, to do justice for his brothers and sisters, whose judicial innovations have improved prosecution practices and saved lives. In this episode, Citizen Arts is honored to present a conversation with Bobby Joe O'Neill, coroner for Charleston County, South Carolina. It's not just about taking care of the body and doing an autopsy, says coroner O'Neill. We speak for people who can't speak for themselves. We make sure there's justice for them and correct answers for their families. And we're in the forefront of the fight against the opioid plague and other health crises. You'll find her full bio in the show notes and at citizenartscreative.org. Welcome, Coroner Bobby Joe O'Neill. Thank you for taking the time to join our discussion. Well, thank you so much for having me. It is really an honor to share with your listeners what coroners do. It's very important. And we are honored to have you with us. Okay, I'm going to start off by uh, citing a, a headline that appeared uh, not so long ago. A car hits newlyweds traveling in a golf cart. Now, the text of the story, bride, a passenger in a golf cart, died at the scene from blunt force injuries sustained in the crash. Charleston County coroner Bobby Joe O'Neill said in a statement, Bobby Joe, if you would please take us through from start to finish, what transpired from the time you were first informed of what happened? I'd be glad to. The role of the coroner, whether it's something uh, like that or um, other things that don't make the news, is to speak for that person who can't speak for themselves any longer. That's the primary responsibility of a coroner and a medical examiner, regardless of what state they're in. It's our job to speak for them and tell their story, make sure we have their cause and manner of death correctly, make sure we know the circumstances surrounding their death, Um, to make sure that we have justice for them um, and all the answers that that family may need. In this particular case, Bobby Joe, who contacted you about the bride and the golf cart? We're typically notified either by EMS or law enforcement when we have a death that's located on scene. Um, Sometimes we're notified by a hospital. If somebody dies in a local emergency room or the hospital setting, uh, that's when we get the first call. And at that point, we then triage that information and determine, one, if it's the right jurisdiction, the right county. I serve one county within our state. And then is it a coroner's case in which we need to be involved in? And in this case, it is. And so then an investigator from my office or myself would respond, and we investigate the circumstances surrounding that death. Did you actually go to the scene or one of your staff go? One of my investigators responded to the scene. So they respond and... um, Uh, examine the decedent. We're the ones who make a positive identification on who that decedent is. And there's a whole process that we may go through about that. We're also the ones who determine whether an autopsy is done or not. Uh, We do go to the scene and we investigate those circumstances to make sure that the injuries we're seeing on the decedent are matching what the story is out there on the street. Uh, We also are the entity that notifies families. So we are that Uh, face that knocks on doors and talks to families, provide them that information. We are the keeper of the record uh, regarding any type of death investigation. So from the beginning of being notified, uh, all the way through our investigation and autopsy, working with families and through the judicial process if we need to. You said when uh, your investigator went to the scene, you inspect the body. Is he or she in a medical examiner or is the medical examiner there additionally? 
so to understand coroner medical examiners, you have to understand that there's really two different types of systems in our country. About half of the states are coroner systems, meaning there is a, a coroner who's usually elected uh, by a certain jurisdiction, usually counties, uh, to represent the individuals in that community. Um, the requirements to run for that office varies. In my state of South Carolina, there's a lot of requirements to run for that. The other half of this country are medical examiner systems. And for the most part, those are individuals who have been um, appointed by someone to serve in that capacity. Most of the time, that's a physician. The service that we provide, whether it's a coroner system or a medical examiner system, is the same. We are speaking for the decedent. We are determining cause and manner of death. Now, in my situation, I'm an elected coroner. I'm not a physician. I'm actually a registered nurse. I uh, started in forensics many, many years ago. I was an ER nurse. Um, I then became a specialist in the area of sexual assault. I did sexual assault exams on victims and sometimes perpetrators. And then I became interested in death investigation. And I've been in this position in the coroner's office since 1998. Um, I hire physicians who are forensic pathologists to do autopsy services for the coroner's office. But we operate as a full death investigation system within this coroner's office, very similar to a medical examiner's office in another state. We have some of the same laws, standards, and requirements. Um, it's just a different system per state. There are no medical examiners then in South Carolina. In South Carolina, if you have a population over 300,000, a community can elect to have a medical examiner system. There's a medical examiner with a capital M, capital E. In my jurisdiction, I have forensic pathologists. They're board certified doctors who specialize in forensic pathology, who are medical examiners, small m, small e. Their title is not medical examiner with a capital M, capital E. Whereas in other states, I have a medical examiner system they have physicians, usually forensic pathologists, who are not only forensic pathologists who serve as medical examiners, but their title is also medical examiner. So there's confusion, but we all serve in the same capacity. I think that one of the reasons that I come away from this a little more confused than maybe most would be my son-in-law worked in the medical examiner's capital M, capital E office in New York City. Would there also be a coroner in New York City? New York is actually unique. They have medical examiners, but they also have coroners in some of their outlying counties. One thing you'll hear about is why is the coroner elected and should that person not be an appointed official? And I would say that I think it's a good thing that the coroner is elected. So many times uh, people ask me, well, why is the coroner elected? Partly it's because one in South Carolina and other states, our state constitution says that there should be an elected coroner to serve the people. Because of that, I speak for the people. I don't speak for someone who's appointed me. I don't speak for the sheriff. I don't speak for the mayor. I don't work for the governor. I don't work for anyone. I don't have to answer to any of those individuals about my investigation or how far I want to take an investigation. That's really important. Now, sometimes People who run for office aren't qualified to run. And so that's a whole nother issue. But I would say in general, it's a good thing that that person speaks for families and individuals and does not speak for or answer to anyone regarding that. As an elected official, how does the coroner remain immune from political pressure coming from somebody who's trying to protect um, a relation or a friend? I think it comes down to the quality of the individual. Anyone can be sort of swayed one direction or the other. But in the end, uh, you know, I took an oath just like any other elected individual to, to protect our community, our constitution and the job that I'm supposed to be doing. And sometimes the community and others don't like our rulings. It's hard sometimes for families to hear that someone took their own life and it's a suicide. But if that's the case, that's how we have to call it. There may also be times when Someone thinks somebody should be ruled a homicide, but we don't have all of the evidence for that. We may have to say undetermined. We come down on the facts as we make those decisions. Now, that's not to say there couldn't be political pressure somewhere. Um, I've not experienced that in my jurisdiction. I have been left to make my own decisions and my own investigation, and that's how it should be. When you go to a social gathering and people find out, well, this is Coroner Bobby Joe O'Neill, what's typically the first question you get? You know, I think lots of times people will say, you know, I don't think I could ever do that. 
you'd have to be very strong to do that. And what makes you want to be a coroner? My background is nursing, as I mentioned, and it's uh, just a continuum of healthcare and how we take care of individuals after they've died. And it's a real honor to be able to speak for people who cannot speak for themselves, to, to tell their story, whether that is because they're using a product that is dangerous, whether we've got an abuse case within a nursing home, whether we have a death in a jail, we need to uh, be clear about what happened. But we have the great ability to not make it painful as we try to answer their questions, uh, make sure that they understand, they know they can trust us. That's quite a responsibility. What's the nature of your relationship with the district attorney? If there is a, a scene where there's a potential crime involved, the prosecutors are going to be there. How do you work with them? In my jurisdiction, we have a great working relationship. Uh, we both know that we have our own responsibilities and we need to stay in our own lane. My job is not to prosecute, not to figure out who done it. Uh, my job is to determine cause and manner of death for that individual to make sure I have them identified correctly and that we have documented all the circumstances surrounding that. But I work closely with our solicitors, what they are here in South Carolina as opposed to district attorneys. And we need to work together and make sure that if we're going to trial, that we're working with them to provide the data that they need and a testimony that they may be asking us to provide. Uh, but in the end, we're, we're all serving the same community and the same family, uh, but we have different roles. All right, so let me take that back to the newlywed who was killed in the, in the golf cart. Your job is to say, okay, she died of blunt force impact. You're not saying she died because that guy ran into the golf cart and that was the cause of the blunt force. There's two things that we are responsible for, whether you're in a coroner's office or medical examiner's office. These are the same across the country. We're determining cause of death. So cause of death is the disease or injury that took someone's life. A heart attack could be a gunshot wound, could be blunt trauma from a motor vehicle accident. That's the cause. The other determination we make is manner of death, whether that act is a homicide, a suicide, an accident, a natural death, or it may be that we can't determine. So that is the other medical determination that we make. Okay, I'm the sheriff. I've got my investigators, my guys and gals are going to get on this. And uh, I've got a lot of pressure coming from the community. It's prominent newlywed. We have different things that we're looking at. They're taking a look at that vehicle that hit the golf cart and they're looking at the speed. Is the speed above the speed limit? I'm also looking at that, but I don't make criminal charges. I don't arrest anyone. I'm trying to make sure that that uh, scenario matches the injuries that we have and that we're able to relate that incident back to those injuries. This seems like a fairly simple situation. We have an individual, a bride, who is hit on the golf cart by a vehicle. It's, it's a motor vehicle accident. Uh, there's a lot of things at play. But there's lots of times when it's much more complicated. And sometimes we have car accidents where it's not obvious what happened. And sometimes they didn't actually die from the car accident. They died because they have a medical event why they happened to be driving. There is why the coroner and medical exam are so important to make sure you know which one of those that is. At what point do you or the member of your staff get involved in the judicial proceedings? We get a fair amount of requests to testify at civil depositions. That's probably the thing we do the most, honestly, civil work where there is a, some sort of accidental death and someone is suing another person and they subpoena us for deposition. We do get subpoenas sometimes for, for criminal trials, probably not as much as the forensic pathologist who did the autopsy. Many times it's the autopsy discussion that they are wanting testimony about, which would be the physician that I work with that performs those autopsies. And these physicians, I, I believe you said you, you call people in or you have people on your staff. Yeah. Who is on your staff? In the Charleston County Coroner's Office, we have about 25 um, employees or team members. About 12 of those are investigators. Those are deputy coroners who go out and investigate scenes. Some have a medical background. Some have a law enforcement background. Some of them have a forensic science background. In my facility, we also run an autopsy suite. So we have forensic pathologists who, again, are board-certified physicians in forensic pathology. And then we have autopsy technicians who help with those autopsies. I also have a whole administrative department and a paralegal. And then we have a number of grant employees who are working on specialty projects related to the opioid epidemic. 
coroners and medical examiners play a big role in public health, how we track deaths, what's causing them, where they're occurring. And so to track those and where the opioid deaths are located, what substances, which communities is really important as we give that information back to our community from a public health perspective. When you said you, you get involved in grant situations, is this uh, an outside organization that's doing research and asks you to provide data, or is this something that you're undertaking with a grant? Well, we've gotten a lot of grants in our office over the years and keep track of our own statistics um, in order to provide that back to law enforcement, to our medical communities on how they are treating um, our citizens. For example, if we see a lot of fentanyl overdoses in a certain neighborhood, we're going to notify law enforcement. We're also going to notify our uh, agencies that serve populations to make sure that they have Narcan available in the community. We also work with other organizations. The Department of Health here in South Carolina has a grant employee stationed in our office to help with opioid tracking and data. And we also have a position through the CDC located in our office. We are helping them track information regionally. Since we're on the topic of opioids, has this plague started to abate or is it as intense as we've heard about in prior years? It's worse and getting worse. Oh, um, my goodness. In my jurisdiction in Charleston County, we saw quite an increase from 2022 to 2023. The other thing we're seeing is mixtures of drugs. When I was young, uh, you know, sometimes college kids would share their Adderall and it was just Adderall. These days, you don't know what's actually in those pills. And so we really have an epidemic of individuals not knowing what they're taking. It's mixed with a lot of substances that maybe they're not anticipating. I want to say something that might be surprising, but I think the opioid fatality numbers across the country that we are seeing now, those are low because medical examiners and coroners are not funded well enough to do autopsies and toxicology on everyone. We're missing a lot of them. The numbers are higher. We have many jurisdictions that don't have the resources to autopsy every individual. Uh, they may or may not have the training to recognize uh, a fatality that's due to a substance, and therefore we're missing them across the country. Um, I think the numbers are really low. We are seeing more and more mixtures in the toxicology findings. When I first started in the coroner's office back in 1998, we would see someone who had overdosed on just cocaine, for example, or they may overdose on just heroin. Today, that's not the case. Today, it's a mixture of lots of substances. So it is not unusual to have someone uh, who dies from an overdose that they have multiple substances in their system, cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, uh, fentanyl, other opioids. Um, we have a, a society that is really using lots and lots of substances, which has been quite a change over the past 20 some years. Are you involved in outreach to the community to inform about the breadth of the dangers from opioid type uh, substances? Yeah, we're a big player in public health and education. We have an, a whole community task force related to opioids and how we provide education. The, the best thing that the coroner can do or medical examiner can do is provide accurate data. Not only how many overdoses we're seeing, but what are those substances and what is the makeup of that combination of drugs? That's really important. The other part of that is we've become a Narcan distributor for the Charleston County Coroner's Office. In particular, if we're on scene and we're suspecting some type of overdose or toxicity, um, and we suspect that family or bystanders may also have a substance use disorder, we're going to leave Narcan behind for those individuals and teach them how to use it. As much as we can, we want to prevent individuals from becoming uh, a part of the coroner's office. We do not want them to become our, our customer. I need a little education about Narcan. Are these drugs that enable people to wean themselves off the more potent types of drugs available? Well, Narcan is an antidote to opioids. So if somebody is having a drug overdose, someone can administer Narcan. It's available over the counter, and that will reverse the effects of opioids, give you a chance to get them medical care, give us a chance to get them in recovery and some treatment. So a lot of EMS departments and law enforcement carry it. Um, families who know they have someone in their family with a substance use disorder are oftentimes given Narcan from their medical providers in order to prevent that individual from having a fatal overdose. So providing that information is uh, a very important thing. Do you become involved in explorations of where the drugs come from? 
Uh, yes and no. If we have someone who, who dies and we're suspecting toxicity, we're going to look into their medical record to see what their uh, substance use disorder history is, what their prescriptions are, what they're supposed to be prescribed. We'll compare what's in their toxicology to what they're supposed to be taking um, prescribed by a physician. The other thing we will do is share information with law enforcement and also the DEA. We may see the same packaging of some sort of illegal substance on multiple scenes. We're going to share that information with the the DEA and local narcotics divisions because they're going to track where those come from. So we're a part of the investigation on the person and how they started using and what their history is. But then we are going to share information with our other stakeholders to try to figure out where it came from uh, and hopefully prevent it from coming into our community. I do wonder how the access to these variations on opioids has broadened. What's changed? Is it public attitude toward using the opioids or is it just more availability? You know, I think it's probably a combination of both of those things. Unfortunately, we have a society that likes to use their substances, whatever those are. Uh, Many times it's used for coping. During COVID, we saw an increase of substance use. Bobby Joe, at what point in your life did it occur to you that being a coroner might be a particularly challenging and interesting profession for you? Well, again, I was a nurse um, and I started off in oncology and I took care of cancer patients. And I lived in Nashville, Tennessee. I was where I went to school at Belmont University. I started working with a hospice agency. And so I was one of the on-call hospice nurses that would, you know, go to the home after someone had died. And, and I would have to call the coroner and get permission to call the funeral home. And I started questioning why I had to do that. Uh, what was the role of this person on the other end of the phone that I was having to get permission from to do certain things. And so that probably sparked my interest. I worked with sexual assault victims and making sure that we documented their injuries and took care of them as patients. And then um, met a coroner and she suggested I might go work in the ER and learn some trauma care because a lot of what we see in the coroner's office is trauma related or psychiatric related. So I started working in an emergency room, which is where I learned a lot of skills on how to assess injuries. And then uh, the coroner in Charleston County asked me to come and work for her. I I sort of was born for this and made for it, I think. (laughs) Um, I can't imagine doing anything else. I love what I do. I love speaking with uh, families and working with decedents and taking care of them and telling their story. I can't imagine anything else. My daughter is in social work, and she works often with terminal patients in oncology. And there is always a struggle on her part to have that mental balance where you can leave the emotional trauma of of working with people like that and having a life outside that. How about yourself? You see some pretty desperate situations. Yeah. Mental health wellness for first responders as a whole has really become a a major topic over the past couple of years because we weren't very good at taking care of ourselves. And, And what we probably didn't recognize a number of years ago, me included, is the cumulative effect of everything that you see and that you take it home with you. And making sure that we have the ability to cope and and have time away from death investigation. When you're a coroner, you deal with death every day. I can think of specific times where um, I cried with families. And sometimes I cried when the family wasn't around. And that's okay. That just shows that we're human. But in the end, we also have a job to do. And we have to make sure that we are doing that appropriately. We're interviewing appropriately, investigating appropriately but then we take time away from it to take care of ourselves as well. It's a really big topic in the medical legal death investigation world right now. This outreach to families that have experienced the tragedy, is that a major part of what a coroner does? Most of the coroners and medical examiners I know around the country uh, take working with families really seriously. It's not just about taking care of the decedent and the body and doing an autopsy. It really is about communicating with families and taking care of them. Now, some offices have just a better capacity to do that than others, um, and it comes down to the individual, but there's nothing more rewarding than getting a thank you card from a family that you help through one of the toughest times in their lives. Um, It also can be very heartwarming when in my own community, you, you know, you're in the grocery store and someone walks up to you and says, you might not remember me, but I remember you. 
you were the one that came to my house the night my mom died or whatever that is. As I work with younger investigators, one thing I always remind them is that as we're interacting with families and making notification, they may not remember what we say, but they remember how we say it as we are trying to help individuals move through the grief process. We're not counselors by any stretch of imagination, uh, but we play a very big role in how they walk through the loss and how they get their questions answered and how they trust the system. And then in the end, how we help them move through their grief process. There's another layer we have not talked about, and that is that you must also be a politician. You run for office. When did you first run for office? And what was that experience like for you? Was that heartwarming or was it, oh my God, what have I gotten into? (laughs) Oh, I'm in my first elected term. We have a four-year term, quite frankly. This is such a special office. We impact people in such a, a great way that it was just really important for me to run. Now, I will say during the campaign process, I actually really enjoyed it because it was about education. It wasn't about politics because I don't vote on anything. (laughs) You know, it's not like I'm in the House or the Senate where you have opinions about all the different issues. I don't get to vote on anything. Um, But I got to educate on why this role was so important and what we impact. Families and individuals in the community don't realize that the coroner or medical examiner can impact whether or not your family gets life insurance. We impact whether someone might be charged for a crime or not. We impact everything that goes on death certificates. And you think, well, what does that matter? Well, if you think about death certificates and where the data goes, our federal government and our state government, they make decisions about that data all the time. So if we have an opioid epidemic, how do they put the money at the federal government? They put it into the opioid epidemic. It's because of the information that's on the death certificate. So if we don't get it right, We have impacted so many things. And so as we talk about the, uh, an election and a campaign, what does, the camp, what does a coroner campaign on? <laughs> what I have to offer is education and making sure that individuals recognize that I hope you never need the services of the coroner. And you may not think it matters what their skill sets are until you need them. And then you want to make sure that they know what they're doing. They're qualified, they're certified, and you know they're following national standards. At that point, you're going to be really grateful that you have got the right person in in that position. You present such a heartwarming picture of the role of a coroner. What you say and how you say it may account for the recognition from your peers in the coroner field. How do they come to know you? I got involved in a number of organizations really early on. I started with the Forensic Nursing Association. I was on their board of directors. I recognize that if you really want to make change, you have to get involved with agencies, organizations, or governments who make policies. And so I got involved with the International Association of Coroners and Medical Examiners, got on the board. We made a lot of headway. Being able to voice what we do, uh, the importance of what we do, and why others need to also value it uh, allows other agencies and stakeholders to come along beside us who recognize the importance of what we do. Right now, the CDC is very aware of the important information coming from coroners and medical examiners. And they are doing a lot to help fund those small jurisdictions in very small counties that don't have the funding uh, to have a, a second investigator or to pay for an autopsy. It's a criminal justice role, it's a public health role, it's a public service role. And so when you can speak that within your communities, your community recognizes that and they ask you to help speak for them. So I've just really been honored. Um, I'm the immediate past president of the International Coroners Association, Corner Medicals Ever Association. I'm the president of the South Carolina Coroners Association and have many opportunities to speak not only at the state level, but at the federal level. And that's a great honor because what we do is important. Leaving Charleston for a moment and looking at the big world that coroners operate in, what might people find that's a little different in their jurisdictions about how a coroner might interact with them? It really depends on the state structure and the death investigation system. So for example, New Mexico is a state medical examiner system. They have uh, one office, you know, in the center of the state and investigators located around the state. And so it's going to function a little differently than a county elected coroner who's in uh, each county. Not better or worse, just operates a little bit differently. And so you may have to figure out how a system works. There's pros and cons to all systems. 
I think the key is that it doesn't matter whether the death investigator is in New Mexico or New York City or South Carolina, we all ultimately have the same responsibility. And that is to speak for people who can't speak for themselves. Is there a particular event that's happened in Charleston County that has been especially challenging for your office for whatever reason? Charleston has the unfortunate distinction of having two uh, mass fatalities. We had nine firemen who died in a SOFA Superstore fire. And then we had the nine parishioners at Mother Emanuel Church in that massacre. We've experienced what it's like to work a major event where it emotionally hits you because this is our community and we have a loss too. Um, It is difficult when the national media shows up on your front steps and is trying to get information when at the same time you're trying to do your job and and take care of families. Um, So that can be really challenging because you're, you don't have all the staff you need, everyone's tired. And then what everyone fails to recognize is that while those events are going on, we also have all of the, uh, the deaths that are normally happening in our jurisdiction. And so we become overtaxed, uh, really exhausted, and then just feel really bad for our own community. So I would say those two stick out, which are, are nationally uh, known. Um, but then I say probably the other thing that impacts us the most is uh, the ones that don't make the news. And that's usually the death of children. Uh, we see children who Uh, die unexpectedly. And those are emotional because um, losses of children are not what we expect. That can take quite a toll, especially if you have on your team, uh, young mommies and daddies who see their own little one in that one. This is a segue to ask about a book you wrote, Investigating Infant Deaths. Can you tell us about what you discovered about infant deaths in doing your research and writing of the book? When I wrote that a number of years ago, there really weren't any national standards on how we investigate the deaths of of children and infants in particular. I was fortunate to be on a team with the CDC that developed some training material on how to have investigators around the country investigate deaths of children. And so the book came out of that uh, because here in Charleston County, uh, myself and the two prior uh, coroners were also nurses. We investigated it more from a medical perspective. We spent a lot of time with families um, getting uh, uh, maternal history and paternal history. Because the coroner is not law enforcement, we interview differently. We were interviewing more like healthcare providers. And so because of that, we tended to get more information from families who had a loss of a child than even our law enforcement counterparts. And we could provide education back to families so that they wouldn't have a second tragedy in their life. Charleston is known as being a very diverse community. How is that reflected in the work you do? Your staff, how do they work with people from different economic, social, racial backgrounds? Do you get into very emotionally tender subjects? How do you handle that? Well, I have a very diverse team. I have individuals of all ages, races, In my experience in the coroner's office, I've been able to enter any community. It didn't matter if it was a white community, a black community, a poor, rich, Hispanic. What they're really interested in is knowing you're taking care of them and they can trust you um, and that you're speaking for them and you're going to be honest with them and provide them the information they need. Um, That doesn't mean it's always easy because there's a lot of emotions. You have to recognize your biases. We all have them, conscious or unconscious. We have the same responsibility regardless of the situation or what part of town it's in. We are going to serve the same way. What have you learned about yourself from being a coroner? My sense is you're somebody who continually explores herself to find the better angels. I've learned to be very grateful and very thankful. It makes you put into perspective when you see what we see every day, really how blessed you actually are. I learned that tone is important. Uh, As I said earlier, people don't remember what you say sometimes, but it's how you said it. And that's very important, especially um, in my line of work. I've also learned the way we improve corner systems and medical nervous systems is through policy. And so I spend a fair amount of time in my state house and state senate. We now actually have a voice on the Consortium of Forensic Science Organizations, which happens to work on federal legislation regarding what we do. That's really where we have to make a big push because our communities do not understand this role. I didn't think I would ever say this because I didn't have the knowledge to say it, but 
I would want you to be my coroner. <laughs> I would want you in my community. Your breadth of compassion and empathy and knowledge is extremely valuable to understand the important role you play in our communities. I thank you and wish you all the best of health. Please take care of yourself out there. Charleston is fortunate to have you. Thank you very much. It's an honor to serve. Um, and I appreciate you recognizing uh, the work that coroners and medical examiners do around the country. What we do is very important. And I, I'm just really grateful to have the opportunity to share that. Uh, have a great day there in the Low Country. And boy, I got to get back there and have myself a nice Low Country boil. There's nothing uh, like right. it. Well, if you come, you got to tell me you're in town. I will. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. There you have it, dear listeners, the latest episode in our Citizen Arts series, In Their Words, What Public Officials Do For Us. We hope you found this conversation with Bobby Joe O'Neill enlightening, and we hope you'll join us for upcoming episodes with the likes of sheriffs, mayors, tax collectors, U.S. Congress people, and more. Citizen Arts is dedicated to presenting information, analysis, and constructive opinion about matters of civic importance. We're a not-for-profit 501c3 organization. Your interest in and support of our work are greatly appreciated. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast. On behalf of Bobby Joe O'Neill and my Citizen Arts colleagues, heartfelt thanks for tuning in. I'm especially grateful to Jill Gabe, our executive producer, and Jeff Lewis, our project producer and technical guru. We invite you to join the conversation. Check in at citizenartscreative.org and let us know what you think. And always, please stay healthy in mind and body, wealthy in goodwill, and wise in action. <laughs>